All right. What is going on, troopers? Welcome to the Trooper Transmission. This is CT3939, but you can call me Paul. And today we're going to be breaking down questions from the Facebook group, Fit for the Republic, doing the 30-day challenge. And this is going to be the 10-4 Q&A. So the October 4th Q&A. We got four really good questions, and I'm excited to dive into these because these are a little bit, um, you know, different from what we've done in the past, talking a lot about recovery and getting the body working again. I know we got a lot of Older people, and when I say older, I mean people that aren't 18 who bodies are still fresh. Uh, we've got some some seasoned vets doing the challenge. And so this is going to be super helpful for you, whether you are just learning and getting into the 30-day challenge or whether you've seen you know many moons and you want to get the body back into shape again. So let's break this on down. So the agenda, here's the questions, ways to improve uh, balance with things like lunges. So we'll dive into that exercises for old and injured joints that one's going to go pretty deep uh so stick around for that how to use tools like ice baths cold showers and saunas for muscle development and fat burning i uh, got some thoughts on that and then advantages to sports drinks versus water so without further ado if you are watching this and you have any other questions you can drop those in the chat and i will pop those up towards the end if i can get to them but let's giddy up and head on in so first question is going to be best ways to improve balance with lunges. And so the way I want to think about this is there's going to be five ways that you're going to improve your balance. And it really kind of depends on what you struggle with the most. But the first thing that I'll see people making mistakes with is that they are doing strength training or weightlifting in running shoes. Hopefully not dress shoes, but basically they are shoes that are not designed to produce force into the ground with barbells or dumbbells or kettlebells loading your spine, loading your legs and whatnot. And so what you have when you do, I'm going to get, show a little bit more of my face right here, just so I, you guys can see this. What you have when you're doing a lunge is your foot is going into the floor. And if you've got big arches or big padded shoes, all of a sudden your ability to press force into the ground is much harder. And so balance is going to be governed by the central nervous system. And it's your proprioception, your ability to orient your body in space that then makes it so that you can stay balanced. Well, when you add in a bunch of variables like weird shoes, well, that's only going to make it harder. So first thing that I would look at is shoes that give you a flat surface so you can produce force into the floor and be able to have that floor push back against you as opposed to padding. Now, there's a few different ways you can do this. I use all, uh, all stars. If you see any of the 30 day series, I'm using, you know, low rise chucks. Those are great. You could also go with Vans, Vivo Barefoot, Nobles. Those are going to be great examples of ones that are maybe a little bit more um, for athletic events, like whether it's CrossFit or you're doing Metcons. Nike makes some Metcons as well. But it really just kind of depends on your training style. And what I would say with this too is if you're going to go and then run on a different day, I would have running shoes. If you just go and try and take the exact same shoes to the exact same or if you take the exact same shoes to every single workout that you do, that's like taking the same golf club to every single shot on the golf course, right? The more specific you can get, the better. Now with that, because your brain governs balance, you want to find one point of focus and give the brain less things to solve for. Because if the brain can find one point of focus and it says, all right, I'm looking at this point on the wall. Well, now it can orient things in space much better. Do this next time, you know, you're just standing, close your eyes and just try and balance, then step on one foot, close your eyes and try and balance. It's infinitely harder because now your brain, your eyes, which is the ocular system can no longer pull in where you are in space. So it's harder to balance. So finding that singular point of focus, being in the right shoes, those are two things that's going to help a ton. Now, this is getting into a little bit of the strength of your feet, but being able to grip with your big toe, like plant your foot on the ground and then try and push your big toe into the floor. That's going to help radiate tension inside of your leg, which is going to help lock that leg in place from rolling out. Now, you might be someone who rolls in, so you need to have a little bit more of an even distribution. I would also really focus on anchoring into your heel. A lot of times people will get really heavy in their toes, and then all of a sudden that heel lifts off. Much harder to balance versus if you get into that toe, you're going to be driving into your hips, driving into the posterior chain, and you're going to feel a lot more connected with the ground. On top of that, if you are just kind of loosey goosey with your upper body as you're going and 
you know, doing lunges or squats or anything that requires balance, it's going to be much harder for your body to stabilize itself. And so make sure that you're using your breath. So as you go into that lunge, it's, or you're holding your breath and it's, and you're bracing your core as you go through and do these exercises. If you've just got a loosey goosey core and you're up top, like raggedy in, well, it's going to make sense that it's harder to balance. And then finally, I would say, change the angle of your torso slightly. If you're super upright, so let's say you got a really upright torso as you're lunging like this that's going to put more pressure and tension in your knee. If you can give yourself a slight hinge of your torso, I can't show you the entire body, um, but you watch any lunge that I do in any of those videos, I've got a 10, 15 degree tilt to my torso. That helps load the hips and deload the knee joint. And so load is going to go into whatever joint is prioritized and whichever one is um, essentially has more flexion, more bend. So if you can create more of a hip flexion, so pretend this is your hip, a little bit hinged to your torso. Now the hip right here is a little bit more loaded. Um, Abigail Mouser, absolutely. Just trying to make sure that the troopers uh, are, are fit for the Republic. So um, those are the five tips for lunges. If you have any further questions on this or want a deeper explanation, I've got a 20 minute video breaking this down each one of these so that you can get a visual. Um, and I put that inside of the fit for the Republic Facebook group as well. All right. Next question. Best exercises for old and injured joints. So first thing I'll say is it depends. And two, I'm not a physical therapist and I'm not a doctor. So I don't have any context on your injury history, the injury that you have, how long it's been injured, what you've tried. So if you're running into this, go and see a physical therapist. That said, the way I like to think about injuries is you get injured, maybe you have surgery, you do that with a doctor or a specialist, then a physical therapist gets you ready to then go and work out. So and train. So I see a ton of people who come from the rehab sector into the training sector. I've done that as a uh, personal trainer. I've done that as an athlete myself at the division one level. You have the physical therapist that gets you strong enough to then go and practice that in a training setting or an exercise setting. So one thing I'll say with this though, that I've just seen hundreds of cases of is if you don't use it, you lose it. And this isn't to call anyone out, but I'm going to call a lot of people out in that the reason why your body hurts is because you're sedentary and you're pretty lazy and not using your body and using full ranges of motion over years is going to then make it much harder for you to then go and ask for that joint or for that range of motion five years after inactivity. I see so many people who will have back pain and it's because they've just sat at their desk. They've sat in their car. They've sat and watched TV for five years. And then all of a sudden they start moving again and the back pain's gone. Right. And so this isn't to say that this is a general answer for everyone, but so much of pain is just a lack of movement. Movement is medicine. Movement is life. And so whether that's taking your shoulder through a full range of motion or whether that's allowing your knee, I can't really get my knee up to go full range of motion or allowing your neck to go full range of motion. Those are going to be little exercises that you might do just to stay loose and stay nimble. Now, the thing that is going to help joints is not actually strengthening the joint. You can't strengthen really, you can't go to like a gym and, and lift the tendon muscle or strengthen and reinforce your ligaments the same way you can your muscles. And it's your muscles that impact the joint and the stability of the joint, the tendon, and wherever those bones go and meet. So I would look at surrounding the muscles or stabilizing the muscles and strengthening the muscles at the surrounding joint. So what I have here in this visual is a, uh, these are the quads, or this is the, so this is the front side of the leg, this is the back side of the leg, this is the knee joint. So what you have here is you have the vastus medialis, you have the vastus lateralis, you have the rectus femoris, these are all quadricep muscles that attach at the knee. And what will happen is people won't stretch. They won't get, you know, full range of motion with, you know, their legs and they won't strengthen the, the or sorry, they don't have both strength in their quads and or strength in the posterior chain. I'll get to that in a second. But essentially, you just have really tight quads that are attaching here. And in this next image, you'll see that they attach up here, right? Quads are going to attach at the hip flexor. And so you get tightness in those muscles, which stems from weakness or stems from a lack of flexibility. 
And so it's going to start to pull on these tendons. And all of a sudden, you're going to get pain on the outside of your knee, the inside of your knee, or the top of the knee itself. And it real and the reality is, is that the pain in that joint is stemming from weakness in things that are up chain or down chain. So you might try and go and walk or try and go and run and you feel pain in a certain area. Unless you had like a very specific traumatic injury to that area, it's likely that there is just weakness or a muscle that is not doing its job a little bit higher up the chain. So from the knee to the hip or down the chain from the knee down to the ankle. And so that's where flexibility, mobility, strengthening the entire lower body is going to be really helpful for the knees. I'm going to get to the upper body in a second, but that's going to stem a lot from the position of your rib cage, your breathing patterns. And again, just making sure that all the muscles are doing what muscles should do. Um, I want to talk to this one specifically. So a lot of times, and let, like, let's use uh, this one real quick for here. Um, Strengthen muscles around the surrounding joint. Okay, so if you use this image um, and, and take what we were talking about in the previous picture as, as a visual, so you might have tight knees or your knees might be tight. Well, a lot of times what you're running into is actually weak glutes, weak hamstrings that are putting your pelvis in a forward tilt. So I'll be here and it's now tilted forward. And so these muscles are doing more work than they should be. These muscles are not doing the work that they should be. And that's what happens when I talk about antagonist muscles. It's basically like the opposite. So you have your bicep and you have your tricep. My bicep is always locked in. That means my tricep is long. This is the opposite version of that. And so strengthening your glutes, strengthening your hips, strengthening your hamstrings is going to enable the quads to sit at a more natural length tension, which is going to take off the tension of them pulling at the attachment points of your knees, of your hips. And now that's just one joint. That's just one example. There's a million different things that can be attributing to this, which is why I say in the first thing, see a PT, but getting in general movement, doing some yoga, doing some stretching, um, loaded stretching is going to be a great way to do things. So an example of that, let's say you go and do um, hamstring curls, right? You are now loading that hamstring as it gets into a lengthened position, and then you're curling it back. That's going to help a little bit with flexibility. Um, there's a lot of exercises that you can do where the hamstring is at a, you know, a fully stretched position. Uh, PNF stretching is an example of this. Again, these are all things that would be 20 minute videos specific to like one muscle group. So I can't give a specific answer for you, but this is where I would start to look. And if you have any questions in this, drop it down below and I can hopefully point you in the right direction. Uh, now, this is I've talked a lot about lower body. Um, I want to talk about upper body here, but let me finish this this one out here. So training proper breathing mechanics, that's going to be the next thing I want to talk about, but I want to just talk th to this point real quick. Um, decreasing inflammatory elements to your diet. A lot of people will get joint pain because it is um, diet-induced arthritis, so they are allergic to something in the food that they're having. Maybe it's gluten, maybe it's dairy, maybe the alcohol that they're having is causing inflammation in the area, um, and so that's going to make your joints hurt. So decreasing inflammation through your diet is going to help joint pain, especially as you get older. And then to that point, stress management. One of the reasons why yoga is so beneficial is because it gets you breathing slower, gets you into a more parasympathetic state, and the brain governs mobility. The brain governs flexibility. And so if the brain is in a hyperactive sympathetic state, it's going to be stiff. It's going to be rigid throughout the entire body. But if you can get relaxed, if you can get into like a warm, calm environment and do some stretching, do some mobility, do some yoga, well, that's going to help with your stress management. So stress is going to play a huge role in this and just like the tension that you're holding, you can see a lot of times too, in like the shoulders and the neck, someone super stressed, they're going to be really tight up in the upper body. That's going to permeate into things like the shoulders. So when I talk about weak, so I talked about weak glutes, weak hip flexors, that's kind of like a lower body framework. Then you have your abdominals. So if those are weak, your lower back's going to be tight, right? Same thing as my bicep. If my bicep is always on means my tricep is not. If my tricep is always on, it's antagonist muscle group. So this is going to be something that you don't want to just do crunches for because there are 30 plus muscles that are involved in how the core works. And this is, you know, something that took me 
months and months to do with daily practice and training. I got rear-ended by a trolley uh, in 2019, and my low back, my mid back, my neck was destroyed. So I had a lot of pain in those joints. I've also had a lot of pain in my shoulders. I'll explain, you know, how you can think about that in a second. But training proper breathing mechanics and doing deep core work and training your core is going to help the rest of your body sit at a much more natural tension. Your posture will be better. So if you've got a jacked up posture and then you go and try and use your shoulder with a jacked up posture, well, the muscles are all sitting at different angles than they should be. The joints are all at different positions than they ideally would be. You're going to run into joint pain. And so I've got a few different videos on this. Um, comment below if you want this and I'll, I'll send you a link to that. But this is going to be the first thing that I would look at to improving joints up and down chain because if your core is not right, something as you as it gets more peripheral. So if your core is not in a good, strong position, the next joint in line has to pick up the slack. So if your core is not solid, then your low back has to pick it up. Then your shoulders have to pick it up. If your shoulders can pick it up, but then your elbows or your wrists can't pick it up, then you get injuries there. The thing that is the most transformational thing that I've ever done is functional breathing. And again, this isn't, I don't have the, the platform or scope to cover that in this training, but that's where I would look at to just like holistically clean up a lot of joint issues because so many things are attached to the core. Um, and then just real quick from like a shoulder standpoint, a lot of people have pain in their shoulders pressing overhead. Well, a lot of what that's going to be stemmed from is weakness in the posterior chain. So rotator cuff stabilizer, stabilizing muscles, your lats, your traps, your delts, all of the muscles that are responsible for getting you out of this position into this position. If those muscles are weak, those muscles aren't able to do their job, then it becomes much easier to be tightened and pinched up here. And so you're going to get tightness up here. Then when you go and try and use these joints, they don't work as they should because those muscles are all crammed together. It's basically just a big party of grossness, um, for lack of a, a better scientific term. Uh, any questions on that? Drop them in the comment section below or in the chat if you're watching this live. Let's dive into the next question. So how to use tools like ice baths, cold showers, saunas for muscle development and fat burning. So first thing I'll say is um, you don't like build, you don't sit in a sauna and build muscle. You don't sit in a cold plunge and the body's just like melting fat. What I would say though, is your goal with any recovery modality is to decrease stress and cortisol is going to be obviously linked with that swelling and inflammation. If you can decrease the damage done to the muscles, the inflammation throughout the body and decrease cortisol, you're well on your way to improving your recovery, speeding up your recovery, speeding up your recovery. Something like cold therapy is going to constrict blood flow and that is going to then improve blood flow when you get back into a more uh, a warmer environment. So you can improve blood flow, you can improve insulin sensitivity. Those are all great in setting up a more opportune or a more desirable hormonal profile so that you can then go and be building muscle or losing fat. Uh, I've also seen things where, you know, maybe like a cold shower can help with depression. I would say if you're depressed, can't hurt. Um, everyone's obviously different and I'm not here to, you know, be a mental health expert, but that's definitely something where, you know, if you struggle with anxiety and getting into a cold plunge or a, a warm heat sauna type environment, and you notice that you're in a much more relaxed state, great, go for it, keep doing it. Um, but ultimately, these are going to be recovery tools. They are not magic, you still got to be consistent with them. Um, and, you know, to that point, indirectly setting the body up for a better hormonal profile to absorb and break down nutrients and partition um, for muscle and energy for partitioning muscle and energy for fat. You know, if your hormones are all jacked up, it's going to be much harder for your body to build muscle and lose fat. So getting your body into a much better place through recovery modalities and by getting parasympathetic and by spending time in a relaxed state, that will then help you down the road. But you could do ice bath, cold plunge, and all of the all of the tools, all the trendy things. But then if you're eating a thousand calories over maintenance, you're going to gain weight. It doesn't matter. If you're not training hard in the gym and getting to failure and progressively overloading and hitting the recovery demands that you need for that and hitting the nutrition needs that you need for that, it doesn't matter that you ice bath. So ice bath isn't going to just beef up your bicep because you sat in it. 
It'll help you recover from the training that you're doing and set you up um, to get back training hard sooner. Um, so how to use these different modalities. So these are just a few generals. The thing I would say with um, anything cold based, it's going to be person dependent. So if it is warmer or, and again, this could be freezing for someone, but I remember after um, games or practices or training in baseball, we would go sit in the ice tub for 10, 15 minutes. We worked up to that. Other people will sit in a cold plunge for three minutes and it's really cold, 40 degrees, and they do it for two or three minutes. It depends on how cold it is, depends on what you can handle, but I would not be sitting in there, you know, just trying to see how long you can hold off to be tough. There's no winners <laughs> for ice bath um, times. Cold showers, you know, I've done 60 seconds and you can start with every single day of the week or three days a week. It can just be something that you do to mentally get you in a, you know, a good place in the morning can definitely be something too to, um, you know, implement into your day. Sauna, 10 to 15 minutes. And one of the things I like with this, if you have access to it, is doing like cycles, one, two, or three cycles. So you do like a 10 and a two or a 15 and a five where you go warm, cold, warm, cold, warm, cold. That can definitely be beneficial as well. Um, all right, I want to come back to this. So Kenzie says, would weakness also explain clicking when making full rotation movements? Um, so the way I would think about this is like you've got a, a, a bone that sits inside of a joint and a joint capsule space. And so sometimes that clicking comes from that bone. You know, I don't know exactly what is running into it for any sp specific person, but essentially you just have uh, a lack of capsule space. And so something is catching and then releasing. So like, I remember when I had a really jacked up shoulder, I would try and do cars, controlled articulator rotations um, from the FRC system. And I would be like, crunch, 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 click, 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 click. Clicking isn't necessarily bad. Like sometimes my knees click, but I can go ask to grass squat, no problem, no pain. But you'll notice when you have really bad mobility, if you go and try and do controlled articulator rotations or just like even just this, like crunch, crunch, crunch. Like I just got a little click here, but it was way worse when I got in my car accident. So um, one kind of principle for that is if you have, you know, a joint that you're trying to take full range of motion, Go until there's pain and then just go a little bit smaller and then you can go a little bit bigger and then you can go a little bit bigger. Uh, cells in the body respond to force. And so if you continue to ask for another 5% day after day, week after week, the body will give it to you uh, typically. And so the thing I would say if, if you're working on getting full rotation movements is like go as deep as you can or as far as you can pain free work on that and then go a little bit further. And that's how you're going to be able to improve that long term. Good question. Hopefully that helps. All right, cool. Advantages to sport drinks uh, versus water. So one, if you're training and sweating a lot, you are going to notice that you are losing a lot of electrolytes. You may not notice that, but that's what's happening. So sodium, potassium, magnesium, these are going to be things that you want to refuel on. There are sport drinks that will refuel you on this. You can also get these from different supplement packets like an LMNT that are going to be solid to utilize in your training or, um, you know, you throw in some water and that's what you have earlier in the day or, or later in the day, whenever you're having it. And then you can also look at it as something as an intracarb fueling. And so uh, extreme example, of this is a marathon runner. So if I'm running a marathon, I'm going to have multiple honey packets or I call them honey stingers is what I was having gummy bears, but it's basically some sort of simple sugar that your body can quickly absorb and break down. And the reason for that is your energy, your available muscle glycogen stores and, and blood sugar in your, in your uh, bloodstream starts to decrease as you train. And as you get to running on empty, that's when you're going to find yourself really draining in your workout. And that can impact the last hour, maybe not. Yeah. I mean, last hour, but basically what I have here is like anything beyond 45 minutes, you start to really deplete. And so having a Gatorade, having gummy bears, having a carb loaded protein bar at that 30 minute mark, make sure that you get back to a good baseline so you can keep training hard in the back end. If I'm running again, like a marathon, I want to have a honey stinger or have some sort of simple carb 30 minutes before I run into fatigue. And so for that might be, you know, at the 45 minute mark, the eight mile mark, like whatever your, your timing is but you want to have it before you notice the symptoms. So again, in this, I would say 
um, you know, if you're working out for an hour, have something at the 30 minute mark, if you notice yourself getting kind of fatigued and you should see an improvement on performance there. All right. Uh, so we got those four questions. We're wrapping up for 25 minutes. So that's pretty good. Um, anyone watching, feel free to drop a question below. Um, but then if you are interested in private coaching, if you're a mom or even a dad, I work with a ton of dads who are like, you know, I've got to get, got a belly. I want to get better habits. want to lose weight and be a good example for my kids. Got a ton of people inside of Fit Nerd Academy. If you are a military or service uh, member and you want to lead from the front and set an example and, and perform the best level, got a bunch of guys inside doing that. If you're a gamer or just a nerdy dude who realizes that you can't just keep playing video games and sitting on the couch all day and have the life that you want, well, that was me seven or eight years ago and would love to talk to you. So comment FNA, FNA below to learn more about Fit Nerd Academy. And if there's no other questions, I will catch you guys in the next Q&A. And thank you guys so much for watching. And this is CT3939 signing out. I'll catch you on the next Trooper Transmission.